Welcome back to The Effect. Uh, we are still talking about instrumental variables. This is our last video on instrumental variables. And here we come to the place where we're gonna try to test some of those important assumptions that we have about our instrumental variable. Now you'll recall, in order for instrumental variables to work, uh, we need a couple of conditions to hold. First of all, we need there to be relevance of our instrumental variable, meaning that our instrumental variable, our source of random variation, actually needs to do a good job predicting our treatment. It's just sort of not really related to our treatment, that there's some, then when we use our instrument to isolate just the random part of our treatment, then that means there is no random part of our treatment. We have nothing to study. In addition to relevance, we need to make sure that validity holds. Uh, that is, we need to make sure that our source of random variation is actually random, uh, at least after we control for a couple of things. We need to make sure that there is no back door between our instrument and our outcome variable, at least no open back door. Uh, we also need to make sure that there is no front door from our instrument to our outcome variable, except through the treatment that we are interested in. We can't have our instrument causing two different uh, treatments. Uh, that would get confusing. There are other assumptions that we need to make as well, for example, monotonicity, uh, which means that the instrument needs to affect the probability of being treated in the same direction for everybody that I didn't talk about so much in the video, but you can check more on in the chapter. So let's talk about a couple of ways of checking our data to see whether it's likely that relevance and validity hold. Now, relevance is an easy one. Relevance is saying that our instrument actually does a good job of predicting our treatment. That's easy because we can just look at how closely related those two things are and see whether they're strongly related. If they are, then we are good to go. If they are weakly related, then that's not so good. Uh, and in fact, it is not so good. If you have an instrument that only does a poor job of predicting your treatment, you have what's called a weak instrument problem. And weak instruments can be very, very bad because they can be very, very noisy. If you recall, way back when we talked about the variance of ordinary least squares, uh, I talked about the things that go into the standard error of an ordinary least squares coefficient. One of the things that we had is that the more variation there is in the predictor, the more precisely we can look at the estimate. If you see x moving around a lot, it's really easy to see whether y is also moving around. But if x only moves around a little bit, there's, it's hard to tell you know, when x is moving up or down at the same time. Right? So you need a lot of variation in your x. And in instrumental variables, we're using only the part of x that is predicted by z. So if z doesn't do a good job predicting x, if it only predicts a little bit of variation in x, then there's not a lot of variation in our predicted values of x, which means that there's not a lot of movement down here, which makes it very hard to see what's going on up here, which means we get extremely, extremely noisy estimates. You can get estimates that are very, very noisy from sample to sample, can change by thousands of percentage points from sample to sample, and basically makes your instrumental variables approach worthless. This is exacerbated by the fact that instrumental variables has what's called small sample bias. Uh, instrumental variables as an estimator is actually biased in a finite sample. It is a biased estimator. Uh, and that is because we are making the assumption that our instrument is unrelated to that second stage error term, right? We need to make that assumption. Uh, now, in the population, that might literally be true. We might be able to say, theoretically, I'm very certain that there are no back doors from our instrument to our error term. Now in the population, that might be something we can verify. We can say, theoretically, I'm very, very certain that the true model says that our instrument is totally valid and unrelated to our outcome. But if you pick a small sample, then just by random chance, that relationship is not gonna be exactly zero. And because it's not exactly zero, that introduces just a little bit of bias into the estimation. Now that's not a huge problem unless you have a really small sample or a really weak instrument. The weaker the instrument is, the more that that bias is going to take up a lot of what's going on in your instrumental variable and the actual effect is not gonna be so much. So you need to make sure that you don't have a weak instrument problem. So how can you test whether the instrument is actually a good predictor of your treatment? The most common way of doing this is by checking the first stage F statistic. And what this does is it looks at that first stage that we looked at with two stage least squares and it performs an F test of the joint significance of any of your instruments. So in this case, it looks at whether our gamma one right there is zero or not. If you have multiple instruments, it tests whether all the coefficients on all your instruments are zero at the same time or not, and you get an F statistic. The bigger your F statistic is, the better a job all your instruments are doing at predicting your treatment variable. Now you might've heard of a rule of thumb that says if your F statistic is 10 or above, then you're fine. That's not really how it works. Really how it is is the bigger your F statistic is, the smaller the IV bias is relative to what you would get if you didn't control for endogeneity at all, if you just used regular ordinary least squares. Uh, and so the bigger your F statistic is, the better instrumental variables looks relative to the bias that it might include. So the bigger your F statistic is, the less you have to worry about bias, but it's still there. Uh, it's not that it just goes away, at least not until your F statistic is positively huge, like 105 or something like that. 
So instead of just using a cutoff of 10 or something like that you might have heard of, uh, instead you want to look at what are called the stock and yogo tables. They show you how big your F statistic needs to be to make sure that the bias, the small sample bias that you get is small enough relative to the OLS bias. Uh, so you want to look at least for a slightly more detailed version of the number that you're looking at. However, this approach of checking the first stage F statistic in its own, just in general, has its own problems. Because what happens if you fail? Uh, if your F statistic is not large enough, then you might say, well, I guess my instrument's just too weak. I'm just not going to do this study anymore, and you'll go away. Now, that's a problem as well, because uh, that sort of introduces publication bias into your estimates. By which I mean, let's say that you have an instrument that is indeed kind of weak. Right? It's not that it's not the strongest instrument. You are pretty certain it's valid, but it's kind of weak. If it's weak, that means that the variation is going to be pretty big from sample to sample. It's just going to be noisy. And so if two different researchers both use this instrument, uh, and they're both using F statistic cutoff, then if this one just randomly happens to get a sample where it's stronger, and this one randomly happens to get a sample where it's weaker, then this person's going to go ahead with their study, and this person isn't. But that, but this person just happened to get a strong F statistic by random fluke. So they're, they have the worst data, but they're the ones who are going ahead with the study. That's bad. So instead, it's generally a better idea to sort of say, I'm going to go ahead with this study anyway, but I'm going to account for the fact that I might have a weak instrument. So a different approach might be to use Anderson-Rubin confidence intervals. Uh, these are basically a different way of calculating the confidence interval for your instrumental variables estimate that allows for the fact that your instrument might be kind of weak. So instead of saying, hey, our, our instrument's too weak, we're going to stop the study and call it all off. Instead, it says, hey, our instrument's kind of weak. We're going to change the confidence intervals to account for that. We're going to make them a bit wider. In fact, they're even not going to be symmetric. You might get a bigger confidence interval on one side of your estimate and a smaller side on the other. Uh, look in the how the pros do it section for a bit more detail on how Anderson Rubin confidence intervals work and how you can estimate them in code. All right, so that is checking our relevance condition. We're checking for a weak instrument and seeing whether we can help account for it. What about validity? So remember, validity is the assumption uh, that we, are, we don't have any back doors between our instrument and the outcome, and also no additional front doors other than the one that goes through our treatment. Now, this one is a bit trickier because this is inherently a theoretical assumption. We are making a theoretical assumption about the relationship between our instrument and something that we can't necessarily observe, whether our model is correct whether we're leaving out any unobservables that might be related to our instrument. So in general, any sort of empirical test for validity is kind of missing the point. You really want to be able to theoretically say with a lot of confidence that your instrument is valid. But there are a couple of things that you can check uh, that I tend to get a bit grumpy about. So one of those approaches is the durbin Wu hausman test. And what this does is it just estimates your results twice. Once it just does your instrumental variables as normal, and another time it uses ordinary least squares forgetting the instrumental variables part entirely. And then it checks how different those two estimates are. The idea being that instrumental variables should be correcting for some sort of endogeneity in your own ordinary least squares model, right? Your ordinary least squares model is bias. There's some sort of relationship between your treatment and your error term that is leading to bias. And that's the thing we're trying to correct with instrumental variables. And so if instrumental variables is doing anything, then we should see that the coefficients are different. Uh, and so if they are different, if the ordinary least squares estimate is different from the instrumental variables estimate, then we say, you know what? I know that instrumental variables has its own sorts of problems. Maybe we have to worry about weak, weak instruments. Maybe we have to worry about invalidity, but you know, it's correcting for something. So if they're different, we probably should use instrumental variables. And if they're, if they're the same though, if we can't really tell them apart, then we might as well use ordinary least squares because uh, it has better statistical properties. It's more precise. I'm not a huge fan of this because think about what this is really telling you. This is telling you that if you don't get a huge difference, then you could basically say, yeah, I don't have an endogeneity problem. I'll just go ahead and use ordinary least squares. Do you really believe that failing to reject a null hypothesis is proof that you don't have an endogeneity problem? Mm, I'm rarely going to believe that. I would be very, very skeptical of anybody who said, I wasn't so sure about my instrument, but I did this test and it said it was okay. So, you know, I'm good to go, right? That doesn't really work very well. Now, to be clear, uh, this is not testing the validity of your instrument itself. This is testing for any presence of endogeneity in your OLS that would require instrumental variables to correct for it. So it's not really a test of validity. It's test for validity of your treatment, which is not quite the same thing. But all the same, I don't really quite believe it in that way, right? I wouldn't really believe that your treatment is exogenous just because you failed to find a difference with your instrumental variable. It feels weird to me. A way that you can actually test the validity of your instrument is using an over-identification test. Uh, so what happens if you have more than one instrument? Well, what you can do is you can say, I'm going to assume that at least one of these instruments is indeed actually valid. And then I'll use that as a form of ground truth to see if the other one is invalid as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare what happens if I use just the instrument that I'm really, really certain about is valid against what happens if I use both instruments. Uh, and if they're different, that tells me that this might be introducing some sort of invalidity here, that maybe this one is invalid. Whereas if they're the same, then I can say, oh great, I can use multiple instruments, it'll improve my precision. Again, I don't really trust this one for the same reason, right? If I fail to reject a statistical null, does that really mean that this new instrument is valid? 
I'm not going to use a statistical test to see whether a validity condition holds. That just doesn't feel right to me. Again, that's my personal thing. Additionally, this runs into a problem with the local average treatment effect that I mentioned before. Remember, instrumental variables is telling you about the effect among people for whom the instrument drives their treatment which is going to be different depending on which instrument you have. Some people are going to be more responsive to one instrument than the other. And so if you do find that these two different instruments give different results, well, that could mean that one of them is invalid, but it also could just mean that they're isolating different parts of the variation and different kinds of responses. Uh, and so you might reject for that reason as well. And so you might end up not using an instrument that is in fact perfectly valid, but, be, but isolates a different part of the treatment effect. All right, so that covers some ways in which we can test our relevance condition, for which there are a number of different ways to look at whether the instrument actually appears to be predicting the treatment uh, with some, enough power to be able to use it and isolate enough variation to work with. Uh, we also talked about a couple of ways that at least purport to be able to help you with your validity assumption, either whether adding your instrument is actually necessary or whether you can just use OLS, or whether adding a second instrument is possibly allowable if you have a second instrument that is you can test whether it's valid or not, assuming that you have one that you're pretty sure works. Uh, both of those I'm a bit iffy on, although I recognize that there are plenty of people who put a lot more trust in them than me. All right, that closes us out for instrumental variables, or does it? Uh, actually, the next chapter is on regression discontinuity, which at certain points is instrumental variables hiding under the hood. So uh, we'll see, we'll continue on with our instrumental variables, but in a hidden way in the next set of videos on regression discontinuity. <laughs>